Africa, going through a lot of developments at the moment, many other countries, seismic changes for some, if you look at what's happening in Zimbabwe, DRC, Togo on your border, the state capture in South Africa. So there's lots to talk about there as an African leader. But let's first talk about the domestic issues and how your country stands out against many of these countries because it's considered so successful. Why is that? Well, as you know, we were the first of the sub-Saharan African countries that had ex suffered colonialism to get free mm. uh, 60 years ago. So that sort of has conditioned the development of our country. And then the first three or so decades after independence were very turbulent and volatile. We went through all kinds of issues, one party state under Kwame Nkrumah, a succession of military governments. And I think that by the beginning of the 90s, especially with the, what had happened with the downfall of the Soviet system, it was a strong recognition in Ghana that really we needed to go down the path of democratic engagement. And that decision having been taken in 1992, we had the first of our seven elections that we have held. And the determination of the Ghanaian people to go through democratic principles and values um, has meant that election after election has been stronger in terms of its credibility and its transparency. And it has also meant that the willingness of the population to accept the results of the our electoral concert has heightened. But how did you get it right when so many countries are struggling with that concept? Because we had passing our, power on, because we had letting our it filter down to the people. Because we had our problems early. We were the first, and so we had the problems first of what is the kind of system. And after, as I said, after the turbulence, after the volatility of the first thirty odd years after independence the people of Ghana, because at the end of the day, it is they that really determine uh, the, the, the evolution and the outcome of, of, of events, made up their mind that they want a democratic government, they were determined on the multi-party state, and they would insist that we, the political actors, also act within. So three times in Ghana, recent history, we've had all changes of government from opposition to government, or government to opposition. And it has been done in a context which has allowed peace to flourish in the country and also for um, principles of democratic accountability. So if you put it work. that way, I mean, do you look at a, a country like Zimbabwe, where we've seen the military uh, step in and take over, basically? I mean, do you think that eventually it'll rise like the Phoenix 2 once it goes through some of the processes that you did? Or is this a totally different story and the different I factors believe, at play here. I think, I think that at the end of the day it will also. The, 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 the determination to, to uh, engage democratic values, I believe, will, will, will triumph in Zimbabwe. Uh, it's a pity that the, the current political situation has degenerated to the extent that the army is finding this itself to come directly into play. In is that ever a solution? It can never be a long-term solution, obviously. It can never be a long-term solution. Uh, but I haven't, we, I've not got enough information about what actually took place and why the, the, this, this situation has evolved for me to be able to say, I, I, this is my position or the position Sure. Of How important is it for stakeholders then to get involved in the democratic process in a country like Ghana? I mean, you've got different tribes, you've got different ethnic groups, you've got different religions. How do you make sure that everybody feels that they are involved in the democratic process, in the education system, that they're all benefiting you know, equally? First of all, you know, the insistence. The political parties in Ghana have a national and not an ethnic coloration. has been very important. The two main parties in Ghana are well represented in all parts of the country. 
They, uh, they have their strongholds. They have regional or ethnic strongholds. No two ways about that. But nevertheless, the coverage, the reach of the parties is truly national. The language of our constitution is also insisting on a national response to it. You, uh, you have all kinds of principles in the constitution, directive principles that insist on the Ghanaian as against the regional or ethnic response to, to events. And, but then I, I keep coming back to the experience of our people who have gone through some very difficult times in the past, a lot of turbulence, and have now decided that they want democracy, they want democratic. And I think that once you have that bedrock, it provides the contours, the context, which then determines uh, state action and the response of state action. And how stable is that bedrock? On, on your border, you've got Togo, it's got massive problems there, demonstrations, trying to overthrow the president. Obviously, you've got ties, strong ties with the country. You've got a refugee situation happening. Are you worried that that could provoke some sort of instability in the country, that it could you have stir to be worried. your attention? You have to be worried. Of course, you, have to. you cannot be complacent. I mean, I remember vividly. 12 years ago, when the father of the current president died, the first uh, president, the Yadama, died, and there was a crisis in the succession. Uh, and the issues that emerged from there meant that 100,000 Togolese came across the border to settle in Ghana. Some are still there, they never went back. It is true that the people who live on the border of Togo and Ghana are essentially the same people. Uh, but is it a, a Togo problem? I mean, Ghana yes. has been accused of meddling in the past. Is it something that should be dealt with internally? It has to be dealt with by the Togolese. We, are, we will do whatever we, do, we can to assist. They're a brother and a neighbor, and they say that when your neighbor's house is on fire, the intelligent thing is to help them put it out before the fire consumes yes. you. So we are, we are and, and we're doing that. We're playing a role in trying to, 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 to see to what extent uh, uh, dialogue and discussions can take place amongst the main actors so that a solution, a peaceful solution, can be found. But they have a peculiar history, and it is that history that is playing itself out now. But I, I'm confident that the, if you like, the march of democracy in Africa is something that is going to be very difficult to reverse. Largely because Do you think democracy represents different things to different people, and is that the way it should be perceived? I think it no, I, I, I see there's a, for me it has universal uh, appeal. It has, it has to do with freedom of expression, it has to do with freedom of association, it has to do with having a capa the capacity peacefully to change government. If you put somebody there, they are no good, four or five years later, you can go up to the ballot, put your ballot there and change them. And, and, and to have that, that, I think all people relish that power and relish that opportunity. I mean, take um, uh, South Africa, which has been a strong force for democracy on the continent ever since apartheid was, 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 was disbanded. Uh, the, even though you've had a party of with over, almost overwhelming support in the country, that party was very careful not to close the democratic space in terms I know, of freedom. But look at it now, what's happening. I mean, you're seeing a, a system that is being, uh, you know, some it's people changing. say it's, it's, changing. It's, it's changing. It's been raped. It's been abused. I mean, is this well, it's also, also one of the problems of liberation parties? Is that... It's changing. It has to change. I don't think that the ANC could, and even those who lead it could think that they would have the predominance they have in South African political life forever. It, it, that would be absurd. Uh, at some stage or another, the, 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 the mechanics and the dynamics of, 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 of development would mean new alliances would form, new arrangements, new political configurations would emerge. And, and do you think that, the mechanics are strong enough in South Africa? I know there's a strong judi judiciary and independent media at the state. Are those factors strong enough, do you think, to keep well, the checks so. and balances? Well, I would hope so, because you, uh, you don't hear... Uh, and the language of, of, of those who think that 
another system would serve South African interests better. Mm. You hear people say, a particular, the president is no good, this is no good, this is no good. Fair enough. But I think that the attachment to the, the values that underpin democratic engagement, I, f I feel that those are very strong in South Africa. And I feel I, that I they're so strong. Proud of Africa, Pan Africa, you know, a strong Africa. When you see what's happening in countries like Kenya, the, the voting process, the election, electoral process that, that seem to have uh, gone through great difficulties at the moment, South Africans and Mubi, does it worry you um, when worries, you see that it worries, coming out? It that, worries, but at the same time, for me, I think that we, we, are all, we, we all have at the end of the day also to be historians and to recognize that the evolution of democracy, even in the areas of the world where it has been consolidated in Western Europe and in America, I mean, went through many, many, many stages and many events, and some of them very turbulent and, 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 and out potentially destructive of democracy. But they were able, on the end of the day, to overcome it, and the, that, and the systems and the principles and the institutions that have been established are now so very strong that it becomes, it becomes difficult to contemplate their being set aside. I mean, even today in Europe, I mean, the events that are occurring with these populist right-wing movements that are taking place, some of whom's undertones yeah. are certainly anti-democratic, but they're still taking place within the democratic space. I think because the institutions of, of European democracy are now very strongly entrenched within the body politic of the various nation states of Europe. I believe that the problems that we're seeing in, uh, on our continent, I'm not saying we have to be complacent and think that, oh, it's happened elsewhere, so we should just sit back and no, it, it will happen to us. But we need to work at it. We need all those of us who are attached to it have to be active. In Can I pick up, sorry, on something you, you said a little earlier on about freedom of expression. So I, I want to ask you about what is happening in your country and homosexuality, for example, which I believe is illegal and it's punishable. I mean, why is homosexuality still illegal in your country? Um, these, the, the social, cultural issues, if you like, um, I don't believe that in Ghana so far a sufficiently strong coalition has emerged, which is having that impact on public opinion that will say, change it. Let's then have a new paradigm in Ghana. Is and that it, something you would get behind? I think, I think that it is something that is bound to happen. And when that happens... What's going to provoke it? What's going to make it happen? Oh, it's, it's the activity, like, like, like elsewhere in the world, like elsewhere in the world, the activities of individuals, of groups, I, I grew up in England. I went to school as a young boy in England, and I grew up at the time in England when homosexuality was banned there. It was, it was illegal. And I lived the period when uh, British politicians thought it was, it was anathema even to think about uh, changing the law. And then suddenly the activities of individuals, of groups, a certain awareness, a certain development, grew and grew and grew stronger and it forced a change in law. I believe that those are the same processes that will bring about changes uh, in our situation. Uh, at the moment, I don't feel, I don't see that in Ghana there is that uh, strong current of opinion that is saying this is something that we need even deal with. It's not, it doesn't, it, it, it's not so far a matter which is on the agenda let me ask you about something you've tweeted about. You say, critically, men and boys must take responsibility to say, responsibility rather, to say no more, no more child marriage. How big a problem is that problem. In, in the country? And why do you think it's still there? Is, is it an education issue or Obviously, cultural? obviously, educational, stroke cultural. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's, it's, it's a matter. You have also uh, economic, the, the economic difficulties that force people to behave a certain sort of way. But these are, these are matters that um, we are determined to try and do something about. We're mm. doing, it's a big because it public. has a devastating impact on society, doesn't it? It does indeed. Mm. It, people, there's a big campaign to, uh, to raise awareness on it. Uh, there's a determination to ensure that the laws are enforced. Mm. Um, 
and uh, the, the general awareness of the society also on the matter is growing stronger and stronger. So we're in a stronger and stronger position to deal with. Mm -hmm. We have other matters of equal concern. Child marriage is there. There's also human trafficking, right. which is very much a function of, of, of conditions of poverty, and yeah. of, of extreme poverty, unfortunately, in some parts of the country and therefore also allow them lend themselves mm. to criminal syndicates who prey in those circumstances to organize um, uh, obviously human devastating, isn't it? Really I know that your wife is very involved in fighting HIV AIDS or she's very outspoken about it. How big a problem is it in Ghana? Is, and do you think that African countries are doing enough to defeat this? I'm not sure on a matter like this I can speak on, on, on a continental right, scale. Right, because it's not really one size fits all, is it? Yes, it yeah. isn't, okay. and I, I wouldn't sure. want to. But I think that we're making a good fist of it in Ghana. Um, the, the prevalence rates are, are declining. Um, the, the awareness of the issues is very strong. It's much stronger in Ghana today than it was, say, 10 years ago. And all of that is part of the uh, response that has been to government's uh, determination to make it an issue for mm. people to, around which people can then... To get to talk about, actually, to talk and remove about. the stigma. Yeah, yeah, it's been important then, but it's, 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 it's something that we cannot sort of sleep on. We have to continually no. be active and, and, and work at it. So I see you are quite active on, on Twitter, and I see that you met Donald <laughs> Trump and another man. Yes. Uh, I'm happy to say your tweets are very different. <laughs> what do you think of him? Well, there's the, 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 the figure on television and what you read about. It's a, a, a volatile picture that you get of, of somebody because he seems to to change views. But then there's a person that we met. I was with a group of um, African leaders during the last uh, UN General Assembly in, in September in New York. Uh, about eight or nine of us were invited by him to lunch. And the impression that he conveyed, the, the, the sense of himself that we all got, was very different from the public image that we had. First of all, a certain humility. You know, he walked in, uh, I don't know too much about your place. Mm -hmm. and I've called you here for you to tell me a little bit so I can know a little bit more. Uh, just have one, he made the statement, I have one or two friends who've gone there and may come to your countries and made a made lot of lots money. Of money. Yes. And congratulate you for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Congratulate you for that. But, but the attitude that he, he showed at that lunch, I think, most of the people, and there were some very wise, and I'm one of the newest in, 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 in the leadership circle in Africa. I've been there, what, 10 months? But some of them who had been there for a long time, I could see were, were significantly surprised, positively so, by his manner. When it comes to Africa, do you think Donald Trump will be good for Africa? Obviously, he touts his America First policy, you seem to have negated what a lot of people thought, that possibly he doesn't know much about Africa, that he's not going to be good for Africa. Where do you think that relationship will go? And could it be a competitor, a healthy competitor to China? The, 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 the America first, I mean, that resonance is not something that is, is necessarily negative as far as I'm concerned, because I think that when you are the leader of a nation, that has to be your concern. <laughs> the interests of your people and your country first. And I think that what we on the continent are also required to do at all times is to define for ourselves what are our interests, what are our goals, and what are the instruments we need to, to assemble to be able to prosecute and, 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 and realize these goals. And do you think it's a healthy balance? I mean, do you think Africa is able to retain enough of what it needs when it comes to the big players like the US and China? Maybe, because at the end of the day, even the period of liberation was undoubtedly helped by the Cold War reality of the West and the Soviet bloc. So to that extent too, I think, yes, there could be a positive aspect of it for us, this competition between the two great 
uh, uh, players of the world, which allows us also to chart our own independent response to what we need to do to develop our continent. You also tweeted that you believe it's time for Africa to come of age and hold its rightful place on the world stage. This Africa will be neither a victim nor a pawn. This Africa will be honest to itself and to the world. I mean, do you think it's ready for that now? And how, does Africa, how does Africa achieve that? It has to be because um, the, the, the caricature of us as either pawns or victims does, does nothing for really our self-respect. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it does nothing for our self-respect or self-confidence. Through Africa's own fault or because of the story that's been told about Africa? Do you think there's a misunderstanding? Well, you know, to some extent there's an element of fault. If you're weak, people will take advantage of you. And that's what we have been for a long time, weak. Take the issue that has become a big issue for us in Ghana. Mm. Sixty years after independence, we are still dependent on so-called donor support to finance important parts of our budget, health, education. Well, that, that's, that surely is an unacceptable situation for any self-respecting Do you think a big family. government will, will achieve, will, will correct I think, the balance? I think that the balance is corrected mm. by policy, mm. is corrected by internal mobilization, mm -hmm. It's, it's corrected by a focus that really that's an intolerable situation and we should be in a position to finance our own development. Uh, let me just ask you about your big government. 48 ministers, four ministers of state, 60 deputy ministers. I believe it's the largest government in Africa. What is the thinking behind that? Because I know that many people do look at Ghana and say, right, when it comes to transparency and uh, corruption matters, think... you are ranking very low. So. How does this all fit is, together and where do you see Ghana 10 years from now? The, the big government, as you call it, is because we need that, that capacity. We have, you have weak, uh, weak institutional structures. You have civil service and public services whose enthusiasm for moving things in a particular direction may not be as strong as they should be and therefore to have a political hand on it that is saying this is where we're going and this is where we're determined to go is extremely important. Ten years from now, I'm looking at a Ghana that is so much, has much greater self-confidence, a Ghana that is now financing its own activities, has reduced considerably its dependence on aid because its economy is working. The private sector of our country is growing stronger and stronger and the arrangements that we need to make with the outside world 